We believe that most of inflammation in multiple sclerosis is driven by the adaptive immune response, the BNT lymphocytes, which specifically recognize antigens or targets within the body. But there's evidence that in progressive multiple sclerosis, much of the injury may be due to the innate immune response, the aspect of your immune system that you're born with. And a new drug, mesitinib, recently demonstrated efficacy in a phase three trial in progressive multiple sclerosis. But how does mesitinib work? What are the potential side effects and what are the results of these trials? We'll take a look today and I have references below if you want to take a look. Let's have some fun. Mesitinib is in a very interesting class of drugs called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And tyrosine kinases in general are transmembrane receptors that initiate a cell signaling cascade. And I'll show a slide in a moment that will make this a little bit more clear. But what they do is they phosphorylate or add a phosphorus to tyrosine residues, which is an amino acid on proteins, and they initiate a cascade of events that affect cells. And mesitinib is a very specific tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which targets CD117, also known as mast cell growth factor, also known as CKIT. And it's specifically on certain types of immune cells in the innate immune system, namely mast cells, microglia, and macrophages. And as I said, they're very important in inflammation and progressive multiple sclerosis, we believe. And it's not an immunosuppressive medication, at least according to Vermersch, who's the lead author on the phase three trial I'm going to show. And this drug is being developed for various other conditions, such as Alzheimer's disease, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, severe asthma, and mastocytosis, which is a condition caused by proliferation of mast cells. So it's not currently clinically used in humans. Interestingly, it's used to treat mast cell tumors in dogs under the trade name Massivet. So this is a diagram of the normal tyrosine kinase pathway. This is the transmembrane protein CD117 or CKIT in this particular case. And normally it binds a ligand and phosphorylates tyrosine, which initiates a complicated cascade of events leading to proliferation, differentiation, survival, and migration of these immune cells, such as mast cells and macrophages. So mesitinib blocks this from happening, preventing proliferation of these cells and hopefully preventing inflammation related to the innate immune system in multiple sclerosis. And one thing that's relatively favorable about this class of drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, is they don't seem to significantly weaken the immune system and are reasonably well tolerated, at least compared to other drugs that are already approved for progressive multiple sclerosis, such as Ocrevus and Saponamod, which likely have worse potential risk compared to mesitinib, although that's not exactly clear. But it does cause some side effects, so the CKIT or CD117 receptor is also in the gastrointestinal tract, so diarrhea and nausea can occur along with swelling or edema of the limbs, rash or lethargy or sleepiness. Hematological changes can occur sometimes like anemia or low levels of white blood cells along with elevated liver enzymes, but it's not very common. Also proteinuria or protein in the urine has also been reported. But a lot of tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been used for many years. For instance, Gleevec used to treat chronic myelogenous leukemia, the generic name is imatinib, has been used for many years and is relatively well tolerated. Research on mesitinib began in mice in a mouse model of MS called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, and it looked to be potentially beneficial. And in 2012, we saw the first trial in humans with progressive multiple sclerosis. Now, this was a tiny pilot trial, only six people getting placebo and 24 people getting mesitinib, but there was a trend towards a benefit. It wasn't statistically significant just because there were so few people. But if you look at the MS functional composite, you can see those getting placebo tended to worsen while those getting mesitinib slightly improve. And if you look at, for instance, the time 25 foot walk, you can see those getting placebo worsened by 26% on average compared to only 5% with mesitinib. And if you look at the expanded disability status scale, sort of an overall measure of disability in MS, and I have a separate video on that if you want to take a look, you can see those taking placebo slightly worsened by 0.3, where those taking mesitinib were about the same after 12 months. And if you looked at primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS separately, both seem to be better than placebo. But again, it was not statistically significant because it was such a small trial, but this encouraged further research.
research. And finally, in September 2020, we got the results of a phase three trial suggesting that mesitinib does work in progressive multiple sclerosis. Now, this has not been published in a medical journal, but it has been officially released and presented at medical conferences. And this was a larger randomized double-blind trial over 96 weeks, and they studied both primary progressive multiple sclerosis and secondary progressive multiple sclerosis in people who were relapse-free. So they wanted to look at people who didn't have obvious active inflammation. And they studied two different doses of mesitinib. One was 4.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, given orally divided into two doses. And the other group started on this dose and then escalated to 6 milligrams per kilogram per day after three months. And they used two separate placebo groups just so that people wouldn't know whether they were getting placebo or not. Otherwise, the dose escalation would give away that you were on the drug. And it turned out that for whatever reason, the 6 milligram kilogram per day dose didn't do anything relative to placebo. For whatever reason, that placebo group did particularly well, so there was no advantage to the drug. So we're just going to look at the 4.5 milligram per kilogram per day dose, which is what's going to be used in future trials, and the dose likely if it's ever available clinically. So there were 656 total participants, but in the 4.5 milligram per kilogram per day group, there were 200 who received mesitinib and 101 who got placebo. So they did two to one random just so you would have an increased chance of getting the drug to encourage people to enter the trial. You had to be between ages 18 and 75, and the median age in this study was 50, and you had to have an EDSS of less than or equal to 6. So EDSS, again, is Expanded Disability Status Scale, and at 6, you require a cane to walk 100 meters. So you couldn't require a walker or a wheelchair and be in this study. The median EDSS was 5.5, which is a level of disability at which you can walk 100 meters, but not 200 meters without an assistive device. And the primary outcome they looked at was EDSS after 96 weeks. And the secondary outcomes were multiple sclerosis functional composite and multiple sclerosis quality of life. And as I said, mesitinib did meet the primary endpoint in reducing the absolute mean change in disability from the baseline level of EDSS. Now, they used a weird statistical technique called least square means, which sort of corrects for covariates. I don't really believe in this kind of chicanery. I think they should just use a regular analysis of the variance, but they specified this in advance, so technically they weren't really cheating. So if you look at the data here, you can see in the placebo group, they worsened on the EDSS scale by about 0.1 versus no change in the mesitinib group. And if you look at the primary and secondary progressive MS subgroups, it was about the same, although there was no statistically significant difference just because it became a smaller group of people and it was harder to achieve statistical significance, but the trend was in the same direction. And if you look at this in graphical form, you can see this is the mesitinib group and this is the placebo group. And so they did get worse on treatment, but significantly less worse over the 96 weeks compared to placebo. Now, the secondary analysis was really interesting. They looked at some traditional outcomes, such as reduction in three-month disability progression. And there was a 37% reduction, although it wasn't statistically significant. And as I said before, the high dose really didn't seem to work. And so that dose will not be studied in future trials. But what was really interesting is when they looked at how good mesitinib was at preventing people from ending up in wheelchairs. So they looked at the probability of reaching EDSS 7. And this is the level of disability where a wheelchair is required for all but short distances. Now, you could only have an EDSS of 6 or less to get in the trial. So no one was using a wheelchair at the beginning of the trial. But a small number of people did end up using wheelchairs at the end of the 96 weeks. And you can see there was a massive difference in cumulative probability of reaching EDSS in fact, a 98% lower risk in the mesitinib group. You can see the placebo in the dotted line. And in the mesitinib group, only a few people at the end were using a wheelchair. In fact, if you looked at sustained EDSS 7, in other words, people who were in a wheelchair and three months later, they were still in a wheelchair. So not just related to fluctuation in symptoms. There were zero people in the mesitinib group who ended up being in a wheelchair for three months or more straight compared to a small number of people in the placebo 
placebo group. Now, of course, this is very small numbers. You can see that only five people ended up with a sustained EDSS of seven, but they were all in the placebo group. So there are three things that really impressed me about this research. One is that it completely works in a different way than other disease-modifying therapies. It has nothing to do with the adaptive immune system, and it seems that we've really underestimated the importance of the innate immune response, especially in progressive multiple sclerosis. The second thing is the relatively favorable side effect profile. Some people just aren't great candidates for certain types of disease modifying therapies. They may have a lot of comorbidities. They may be very susceptible to infections already. So if this drug, Mesitinib, truly isn't an immunosuppressant, which I'm not wholly convinced of, that would be very favorable. The last thing is that I'm impressed that this drug seems to prevent people from reaching higher levels of disability. For a lot of other disease modifying therapies, there's evidence that they work best in people with lower levels of disability, but we need something for older people who may already have significant disability who may not have relapses or make new MRI lesions, and the data on reaching EDSS 7 was very impressive and provides a lot of hope to these people in my opinion. Of course, it's not enough to do it once. The drug company must do it twice to get FDA or EMA approved, so I'm sure we'll see a second phase three trial, and I look forward to those results. I'd love to know your thoughts on mesitinib, or if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos.